morning. Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. As we gather around God's word today, we get to take a look at who we are in God's name and what that means for us now that we get to serve our Lord. Today we are also going to be celebrating the Lord's Holy Supper. We ask that only those who are uh, members of the Wells or ELS congregation will join us. If you have any questions about that, we'd love to talk to you about it afterwards. To begin this morning, then, we will sing our first hymn, that is hymn number 221. Grant us forgiveness. 
Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner.
be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. For our song of the day, we'll sing Psalm 111. You'll find that on page 106 in your hymn.
Our gospel is recorded in Matthew chapter 5. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world, city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, that the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. now have an opportunity to confess our Christian faith together according to the words of the Nicene Creed. You'll find that on page 18 in the front of your hymns. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He has sent men to heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our hymn of the day. That's hymn number 283.
tonight. The message for our meditation is found in 1 Peter chapter 2. You find yourself out at an event, some people you know, a lot of others you don't. And when it comes time to introducing yourself to those new people, how do you do it? You walk up to them and you shake their hand, you say your name, you say it's a pleasure to meet them. Typically, what's one of the first questions that gets asked right afterwards? It's what do you do for a living? It's actually a, a really good question because it's, it's not intrusive. People like talking about themselves, and when you hear their answer, what they do for a living, it tells you a little bit about them. It also opens up other avenues of discussion for, for later. That is, unless you're in the line of, of work that my brother is, who's a mortician, and people hang their head and they don't say anything afterwards. All the other jobs are here are typically pretty good. In America, we kind of view identity, who we are, with what we do. Our jobs, uh, what we do as, as a living as far as our fam familiar relationships, things like that, we, we kind of wrap it up all into one. That's just one of the things that we do in our culture. And that's why it's such a hard thing for people to lose their jobs. Somebody loses their job, they, they begin to wonder, who is it that I exactly am? Or when they all of a sudden have a major life change, like a divorce. Who is it that I am? I'm no longer husband, I'm no longer wife. Where do I fit in? What do I do? It's something that we struggle with a lot. We wrap up who we are into what we do, and yes, the two are associated, yes, they are connected, but is what you do defining who you are? Is it that you're a plumber and that's it? Or a nurse, a Republican, or a Democrat, somebody who votes for one team versus another team. Even some of the issues that we're witnessing right now with genders and sexuality, where it is it that somebody fits into this whole situation? It's all wrapped up into identity, at least that's what a lot of people think. And when people are struggling with these things, it affects all of their lives, and these are not people that are to be despised or to be looked down upon, they are people that should be people pray for and help because they need it. After all, we, we get it. We do struggle with our identity and, and, and who we are. Who is it exactly that we are? But what God comes up to today in our, our lessons, especially in the gospel and in our second lesson that we're looking at, and he tells us exactly what we are, who we are. He tells us that we are salt. He tells us that we are light in the gospel. And then, in the second lesson, he tells us that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. But in these lessons, he also goes ahead and says, you are, so be. Because you are salt, do salty things. God is going to preserve the world through his church, through people like us, through the works that he does through us. God is going to allow others to see Jesus because we are the light to them. Jesus is our light and we simply reflect that light for others so that they can now witness him and what he has done for them. We are also to be this royal priesthood, this holy nation, this people belonging to God. We do this not only for our sake, but also for the world's sake, as, as Peter tells us. Dear friends, I urge you, as aliens and strangers in the world, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. For such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. There are probably two main reactions that people are going to have when God tells us things like this from both of these lessons. One is that we are going to look at this and say, how could God ever choose me? What a wonderful blessing it is that God is going to allow me to be his servant to do these wonderful tasks and these jobs for his holy name. And I hope that is the way that you feel, at least sometimes, because what a wonderful joy it is to be a servant of the Lord in any capacity that you can think of. It is an awesome thing. But I will admit, this is not typically my normal reaction to hearing God calling me for a work of service. My typical reaction is that of fear. Because I know God, and I know myself, and I know what a sinner I am. I know what I have done, and the things that I should have done. I know what I have done wrong, and 
because of this. I know that there have been times that I, I'm the kind of person that would drive somebody away from Jesus and not show them Jesus, not point them to Jesus. You look at who we are and you say, God, why? Just keep me hidden away. God, don't promote me. God, don't put me out there. Don't make me your light. God, hide me. I'm only going to mess it up. I'm only going to tarnish your reputation and mess up your church. Just keep me away. That's how I feel about myself, and I know it's how you feel about yourselves when you're struggling with your sin. Because that law, it is a constant companion when you are beating yourself up after you've seen what you've done wrong. But the kind of people that have exasperated a child push them so hard because we can understand the fact that they are just a simple child. The kind of people that get caught up in the, the fun of gossip are so weak-willed that we haven't even give in to that and we end up hurting our friends and our family. The kind of people that pain our spouse. We're, we're the kind of people that are constantly lying to others around us, putting on this idea, this false narrative of self and who we are. In reality, we're messed up people. God, hide me. Keep me hidden away. But God's not going to do that. Because that's not how he sees you. And that's not who you are. You are his prize. You are his bride. You are his salt. You are his light. You are this royal priesthood. You are this holy nation. You do belong to him. Why in the world would he ever keep you hidden away? Of all people, he's worked far too hard for you. He's put in way too much effort for you. He's had you on his mind since before the creation of the world. Not that we can speak in terms of time before time, but how many days, how many hours, how many decades did God plan your life, putting situations into play, your good works that you would do for his holy name? How many times did God think about you and what your life would look like and all the people that would be around you as you would help each other out? God's been thinking about you for a while. God's always been thinking about you. God had you on his mind when he was making his way to Golgotha throughout his earthly life here on this earth. And as he was walking up that, that pathway to Golgotha itself, who was it that empowered him there? It was the thought, yes, of pleasing his father and doing his father's will, but is it not also you? You who empowered him, that you might be his own. The thought of that is what drove him to that place and what allowed him to go and show such love. You, for your sake, God did all this. But why? Why me? Doesn't God understand who I am? Well, yes, of course God does. My aunt sent me a, a meme this past week. I've been thinking about it the last couple of days. It, it, it's something that showed up on social media a couple of years ago, but I hadn't seen it until now. And it said that when God was planning out your life, he took into account stupidity. <laughs> it's a crass way of putting it, but isn't that kind of comforting as we think about that? God thought about all the ways that we were going to mess up, and he knew about them, and he still put us in this situation. He still said, yep, you're my prize. You're my beloved one. God knows your sins. And even in a strange way, I, the Bible talks about it this way. Our, our sins, they have been paid glory to God. Understand me when I say this. I'll, I'll use Paul's words because he does it better than I do. It's from 1 Timothy 1. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that to me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. How awesome that you, a person who should be damned, a, a sinner, are now somebody that God lifts up and holds up as something wonderful that would be his prize, his salt, his light. That, that is what you are. You are now one of his servants, and yes, even in this, in your weaknesses, you are a walking, talking example of God's grace. The unbelievers of this world, they are never going to be shown Jesus by the perfect Christians that exist out there. If they relied on the perfect Christians that exist out there on this side of eternity to show them Jesus, they would never see him, because there are no perfect Christians on this side of eternity. There are only weak Christians. That's all we are. That, that's all that this church is made up of here on this earth. We're sinners. We're a bunch of sinners. We're deeply flawed and we still struggle. We are people who have been down in the pit because of our guilt. 
We are people that have seen the terrible nature of our sin. We have looked at it in the mirror. This is who we are. We understand what it's like to be down there and to deal with that kind of guilt that weighs upon our shoulders. We also are people who know what it's like to be raised up by Christ's forgiveness, to be shown the cross, to be shown his love in something like you're going to partake of in a few minutes' time. We have seen the greatness of our Lord. And because God has shown his, us his greatness, we now stand as beacons for the world. Not that they would see us as being great, as an example to strive for or to live for, but that they would see us as who we are, these frail beings. We're still here. In spite of it all, in spite of the problems, in spite of ourselves, here we are, sitting in church, listening to our God's And God still is preserving us after all of this. And so it is not so much us they are looking at, when it is us who are doing these works for our God. It is our Savior, much as it's always been. Anything that I do now, it's really about Him. It's Him who's doing it through me. It's that He is the one who raises up sinners and makes them a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. And when you do this, when you are this, which you are, I declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Think about what the sin means for us. If my sin, not that I'm ever striving for such a thing, if my sin now serves as an example to myself and to others around me of God's forbearance and his patience and his long suffering, that God is just that gracious of God that he'll even put up with me. If I go out and it's not really me who's doing this work any longer, but rather it's, it's Christ who's living in me, what have I to lose when I work for him? It's such a great honor, it's such a wonderful blessing to be this royal priesthood and now to act upon it as well. You can't fail, not with God on your side, not when you know what is coming your way. The end to it all for us as believers is heaven. God will see to it and he will be with you to make sure that he walks along inside of you and continues to give you his word and his sacraments for this purpose. And just so that we might be quite clear on this, what God has made you is not something insignificant or small. It's not just a miracle in that you were dead, but now you're, you're kind of alive and you're, you're kind of doing something for His name. No, you are raised to the ultimate positions in His kingdom. You are the servant who is so wonderful in His name that God would even call you a royal priest. Do you know how absurd of a thought that is? As we look at the Old Testament times, there was only one group of people, one tribe that got to be priests. They were the Levites. You know how many of them were kings? Zero. You look at the kings, and yeah, it started out with a Benjamite and a person of Saul. But after that, it turned to a time to the tribe of Judah with David and his lineage that followed after him. God goes ahead and he, he takes us and he gives us the best of both worlds. We're not just priests. We're not just kings, we're both. We're royal priests. So whatever we set out to do in his name, we have to sure confidence that we are his royalty. Just as a prince or a princess doesn't have to be worried about how they're going to be regarded because they are simply doing it for their father. So we get to go out into the world and we get to do this for our God too. In his name and out of love for him. And as we go ahead and we act on their behalf, we know that our work is actually going to be fruitful and that it will be beneficial. When we are these priests, when we are the mediators and intercessors for those around us, guess what? We actually have the right to do that. We get to go to that throne of grace on their behalf, for their sake, offer up our prayers, and we know that God will hear us. This is who you are, and this is what you do. If you ever forget about this, if you ever are struggling, trying to figure out what it is that you need to do, or better said, what you get to do, Come back to who you are. God tells you, you're somebody who's wonderful in his sight. Chosen people, royal priesthood, holy nation, people belonging to God. You do to get to declare the wonderful praises of your Father. Amen. Please rise. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We turn to page 20 as we sing the Creator.
eternal Lord, give us peace as we ponder the good news that you forgive our sins in Christ. Work in us so that we believe and let the word we have heard today. Provide courage and passion to all who preach and teach your word. Fill them with a love like yours as they proclaim your grace to us and all people. Move us to love all ministers of the word wherever they serve. Guard and guide the families of our congregation, and husbands and wives to love each other with commitment, respect, and patience. Help parents to grasp the eternal value of keeping their children close to Jesus all their lives. Grant joy to those who are single, and make them a blessing to others. Protect us from the temptations that surround us. Give us pure hearts and minds. Provide wisdom and insight to those who make laws and set policies. Give us respect for those who protect us from crime. Lead us to value the rights of our fellow citizens and to defend those who cannot defend themselves. Bless our land with peace and prosperity so that the gospel may be proclaimed to all. Give us passion to share the story of your love with our family and friends. Overcome unbelief and open the hearts of people everywhere. Lead the good news that Jesus has forgiven their sins and open the gates of heaven. Fill us with joy over every sinner who repents and comes to trust in you. Extend your healing power to those who are sick and suffering in body or mind. Give patience and compassion to all who care for the sick and dying. Lift the eyes of distress to your love in Christ. Hear us, son Lord, as we pray in silence. Hear our prayers spoken in silence answer them in your wisdom and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And it is in Jesus' name that we also join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We continue then with the sound. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
being with you. Well, we thank God all of you for coming today, especially the guests and visitors. If you wouldn't mind uh, signing the guest book that is located right out into that uh, uh, area as the exit church, that'd be wonderful. Uh, a few announcements for us. We have Bible class starting back up. Uh, this is going to be taking a look at the, the foundations of our faith. It's uh, the class that we take up for if somebody ever wants to, to join the church. Uh, but also it's a great review for those who are already members of the church because it, it takes a good, again a look at uh, some of the wonders God has done for us. Uh, Men of His Word, the 14th annual uh, version of this. It's going to be held Saturday, February 18th, uh, down in Oshkosh. You can read more about that in your bulletins. Uh, FBL, Fox Valley uh, Music Fest is going to be held this afternoon from 1 to 4.30 p.m. Uh, then the annual report and membership uh, list. We thank uh, Dennis and Susan for, for putting that together. That should be located in your, your mailboxes back in the back. And then finally, we now have Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I heard about that Mike, where is Mike? Mike is our, our resident Facebook expert, right? Where is Mike? Oh, so yes, right? So you can ask him for questions. No, I'm just teasing. Uh, but yeah, we, we do have a, a Facebook and, and uh, Instagram. So one of the biggest things that are, are, is going to help drive this are pictures. So if you have pictures of the church, they can be throwback pictures, they can be current pictures, uh, they can be uh, any pictures around work days, things like that. I'd love to have them. Uh, and also, if you'd like to help out with keeping up these, these pages, just let me know and uh, we'll, we'll get you involved in that. That is it for our announcements, so hope to see you in Bible class, uh, but also have a great rest of your day.